Hi everybody, my name is Liam Martin and today we have Vladislav. And maybe that was the incorrect pronunciation. I was practicing it mentally, by the way, in my head uh, before <laughs> we jumped on to this. He also goes by Vlad and he is the founder and CEO of Belkins.io, which I have been looking at for quite a while now. And I would probably really say this is one of the most interesting uh, user acquisition agencies, KPOs, BPOs that I've seen recently. You're only five years old, which is absolutely amazing. And you're going on year six. And already you guys are doing massive movements in email outreach, uh, sales development, working on CRM stuff, LinkedIn outreach, all of the stuff that I actually, to be honest with you, really need more of. And I'm sure that if you're listening to this podcast, you probably need a little bit more of that as well. So Vlad, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Um, first question, what was your top personal and professional win last week? Good question. And thank you for having me today, Liam. Uh, pleasure to be with you today. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess my my personal win for the last 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 day that I recall that I had like full sleep. Uh, it's just super simple. So I think that's the full sleep cycle that I had like super good one, like eight ten hours, and I'm super happy about this. And I want to share this because uh, running agency for five years, uh, like bootstrapping, so we didn't raise anything so far. Uh, we like. Uh, with my partner Michael, we are super crazy, and uh, in terms of what we are doing, our dedication, hard work. So it's really super. Like I really appreciate the time when I try, like finding out uh, how I can spend and recharge with all this energy that I spend on a daily basis to like speaking to like a lot of people, my team, and like recharging everyone because being a CEO at a company that's the you know a lot of pressure. Uh, mm. Yeah, so that's super simple. Mm. And uh, a professional win. By the way, I have this thing, which is an Oura ring, and it allows you to be able to measure your sleep score. And I unfortunately have not been doing very well the last uh, few weeks. I did a lot of conferences. I did like four conferences in one week, three or four weeks ago. And you can see the impact that it has on your sleep score. I think I'm floating at around like the high 60s, low 70s, which is very, very bad. I have a buddy of mine, Aiden, he runs a company called fellow.co and he is between 95 and 98 every night. Just blows me away how fantastically well he can do at sleep. Um, professional win. Professional win. Yeah, what's a professional win this week? Yes, so uh, um, this is the, I think that would be good to share the one success from uh, products that uh, I'm in charge with, it's Folgerly. So we have a great number about how we decrease the customer acquisition cost for a marketing funnel. Like uh, we used to have like four or five hundred uh, dollars per uh, per one meeting scheduled for my sales executives back there back, back uh, uh, for fall Julie. and we had the chance like six super success to decrease it like tries so basically now from marketing standpoint one scheduled meeting for my sales executives and fall Julie costs like less than a hundred bucks which is like um, super efficient and we can scale those things up and it's like super random. And okay, how did you do it? Yeah, so basically uh, we are, I guess that's the, that's the result of constant investing in the content and SEO and put a lot of efforts to bring organic traffic on our websites. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, on, in every and each of, of our projects there and uh, this kind of result that we're getting over the September. But we do have so we started September super slow. I didn't know if everyone's seeing this, but uh, September like oh, we're like August few years ago, like uh, a few years ago in a row. Like everyone on vacations in the middle of September, everyone returning after like twelfth, thirteenth, uh, etc., and starting to move over the business season only in the second half of months. So maybe that's that's the thing also. Wow. Okay. Well, that's uh, 
that's pretty crazy. If I could cut my user acquisition costs by um, by 30, 40%, it would be mind blowing, but you've done way better than that. Uh, with that said, what does Kelp Belkins essentially do? What do you guys do? What would you, if, if a one phrase pitch? We are sales acquisition agency. So what that kind of means? So basically we are focusing on appointment setting. Uh, we're using the different acquisition channels. Primarily we are focusing on email marketing, mm -hmm. basically called email outreach. And we know, we do know how to use email in the right way and to deliver like demo calls, meetings, like sales qualified leads. And we're doing this over the email. And uh, for the five years, we are super successful and we get like hundreds of five stars across different, uh, different uh, re review websites. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of our core differentiation there because we know how to do it in the right way, spending mm -hmm. the right time on each and every process of email that we're sending. So that's the interesting thing. Okay, so what's the right way and what's the wrong way? Good question. Mm -hmm. So the wrong way is like uh, to send emails how we get used to. Like mm -hmm. you get some word like database of leads that like, I don't know, you can buy them from whatever you want. You can like, I don't know, work with your subscribers or you have a team who like pulling those leads from some tools like, I don't know, Zoom Info, Crunchbase, LinkedIn or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you basically have this kind of spreadsheet. Let's say spreadsheet. Someone doesn't have a CRM system, but uh, everyone do have spreadsheets mm -hmm. and a lot of thousands of, uh, you know, CSVs and XLS. So files and basically you uploading this to some tool that's sending emails. You have like hundred thousands of them. Like, you know, <laughs> there's really a lot of them and you just press start button. So that's the wrong way how to do it. But okay. yeah, basically everyone doing this in this kind of way and like frustrating why email doesn't work. Or even though people starting to say that email dead, cold calling is dead and uh, there is no acquisition channel that can fulfill my pipeline or whatever. So, uh, and answering how to do it right. So we like, you know, nerds of uh, like, uh, cr like in creating processes and products. So I would say that email marketing for us under the microscope, looking like the, the following process, we have team that creating those kind of leads. We are spending a lot of time to creating like company names list. We stay spending a lot of time to creating, uh, like matching the email addresses. We were, we were refining those email addresses to bounces who doesn't know what kind of bounce email bounces. That's kind of automatic that you're getting if email doesn't exist or there is like security reasons to not get your email through. We uh, have this kind of, in the first step, only in the first step, we have five steps verification, like manually hand tailored with the system, with the product. And only then we passing leads to a second stage, which is uploading to system. Okay. Uh, in this kind of process, before uploading to system, we do have email deliverability process, process which is mm -hmm. mean we're spending a lot of time and efforts of preparing mailboxes and domains to send whatever content you have under your email. So you guys are warming up domains in other yeah, places. Basically, okay. uh, we, I, would, I wouldn't say warming up because this misconception. So, mm -hmm. uh, this email deliverability is rely on setting the right, uh, properties for your domain and like prepare for technical speak. So basically you have DNS records that you need to configure under your domain and treat this like okay. you have passport and you need to put a lot of visas to get to your clients mailboxes or something. And you put sure. in the right like settings and you over those settings, you explaining what tools are you using? How often, what do you do if you do not comply or your clients do not comply with receiving your emails, whatever. Then you have warm up like, having starting with low volumes on your mailbox is like sending one email, then five email, then 10, 12, 15, like, you know, 50, 100, 200. So you have graduated a volume, a volume based approach to volumes. Mm -hmm. Another side of those things. So it can be for some people, I guess, pretty boring, but this is the way how it works. So, um, basically we are spending a lot of efforts to creating the content and we do have like 
content team behind. It's not like GPT run uh, on our behalf or something. We do have like great team behind creating the templates, getting the right, you know, uh, CTAs, uh, right headlines based on our experience and having like leads in the right way, content in the right way, deliverability in the right way, only then you can start your campaign and get the results from it. Because everyone's starting to spray and pray those billions of emails and to be like accurate, I know the, uh, the, the right number of emails that's sending on a daily basis, it's 300 billion of emails sending on a daily basis. That's like mind blowing. And uh, only 60% of those emails like end up in spam folder and even though it's legit content uh, right. or in promotion folder and only 40% of those emails reach out but fr from like three, 300 billions of emails for 40% 40, 40 is really a lot and you can imagine how slim those mailboxes are of your recipients. So yeah, mm -hmm. without those, I don't think you can be successful with email marketing at all. Um, title tags, I'd love to hear because you talk, you kind of just you talked about how you're, you're crafting specific titles in your emails. Could you go into that a little bit more? We've had, and we've tested this a lot internally, but you'd have a lot more experience with this than we would. Our best overall outreach email is hi or hey, Vlad, comma, quick question. That one just blows everyone away in terms of the <laughs> rate. Uh, like I, we have been, I think we've tested maybe about 70 or 80 different titles against that. And we still do test from time to time, but fundamentally that's like the best one that we've had in terms of just direct outreach specifically for link building. Uh, do you have any kind of golden nuggets that you would like to share? Yeah, I do have to actually, and this okay. almost look alike with your one, uh, but we starting with like headline, it's you or you're like name of your co-founder or senior or head of sales or like whatever person that in charge of particular service let's say you're selling i don't know like manufacturing and you like go to like uh, i don't know some person in the company you have basically two of those people that you wanted to reach out and basically a template will be like vice versa you or john or you or and like uh, Michael, let's say, and uh, the content stays for like, hey, I don't know if the, you are right person, you are you are Michael or in regards to this kind of matter, business matter, let's say I don't know, a lead generation, and he is like, okay, that's me, or passing email to Michael or John, whatever person, and you starting like it is kind of icebreaker that works and we call this yeah. waterfall approach because everyone wants to be in charge of something and basically this kind of pull over the blanket to answer to the important email you know and this kind of works good and we also have one interesting approach with la last email in this sequence like five six email that we are sending it's t-rex it's like super fun it's basically uh i didn't get any answer for you or reply um, you chase by t-rex or something so we go to with super right. gamification yeah. and uh, people always say that they, yeah they get lost with like running out from the t-rex or something and you have like you give them options so first you do not want to talk to me two you are chased by t-rex three it, it's not the right time for you and people go still with some sort of answer because they they still getting emails from you and reading all those emails but they didn't have the time to answer mm, okay that's crazy i uh i'll definitely try a couple of those as well i've got one which is the um the ceo forward email so somewhat like i'll i will write an email saying Hey, could you reach out to Vlad? I'd really like to talk to him about X, Y, Z, right? About, okay. um, about time doctor or about running remote. And then my SDR would use that as a forward and then would email you saying, Hey Vlad, my, um, you know, my boss, Liam really wanted to reach out to you about this particular issue. Do you have 10 minutes? So it would be like a forward chain and it would show that I was the one that was basically making the initial request. <clears throat> that one seems to work quite well for like very distant associates, but the, the, um, Hey Vlad, 
quick question. It's just so easy. <laughs> yeah, it's right. like standard and we don't have to change it. So we say, hey, Vlad, quick question. And it's just like everyone wants to open up that email for some weird reason. I think it was sitting at about a 30% <laughs> open rate generally right now that you've got, great. which is uh, which is hilarious. If someone were to start this without Belkins, and obviously, you know, the easier way is just to go to Belkins and, and start working True. with you guys. But how would you build out that operation? What type of people would you need in order to be able to do scale? And I'll use I'll use our company, Time Doctor, as a perfect example. Right now, we probably need, uh, <clears throat> let's say I, I needed to get 100 new paid customers in the door just through cold email. How would I structure that team in order to be able to execute on it? Actually, this is a good question. So um, from talent standpoint, you obviously need to work with the, with the talented people. Mm -hmm. And from the beginning, I, I, I can say for, like from Balkans perspective, so we started Balkans with uh, first of all client oriented approach and we connected with the people that working with us here, the great people, uh, they basically so care about people like they super, they putting a lot of efforts to deliver results to them and uh, we build the motivation around uh, performance. So basically, we, I can say that we are performance-based company. So as long as client is successful, we are successful within the company. Right. And uh, if I would say that uh, that I need to have like 100 clients by uh, call email outreach, so basically I would structureize this the following way. So I would uh, create the outbound team. First of all, mm -hmm. outbound team that will contain the um, data researchers, people who will take care of data. I would, sp I want to split this, the the function from SDRs because they need to be focused on qualification, sending emails, jumping on the calls. Okay. Yeah. So I've got my data people. Uh, let's say yeah. I have one or two data people. How yeah. many data people do I need per SDR? One I, per SDR, or is it you know, or is it two data SDRs to one data person? How does that yeah. look? I think I think the, the the right approach would be to go from the hundred meetings and how we can get hundred meetings from conversion standpoint. So let's say you have ten percent conversion to meetings. So uh, okay. I assume that you need ten thousand leads, right? So yeah. um, ten thousand of MQLs, marketing qualified leads, before before we starting engagements engagement with them. So basically, our conversion is like. 10%. So I can say that one uh, lead researcher can uh, can work with 3,000 3, leads from my okay. experience. So you do have like four or five people to cover mm -hmm. this. Uh, you can have two SDRs, but you know, from my experience, we had our BDR SDRs that uh, by one person, they, they can like deliver 50 plus meetings. So we do have few people that reach to 100, 100 meetings scheduled per one person. So they just had en like enough leads to cover this. So I think that one, two SDR that uh, will primarily focus on like talking to people, uh, schedule meetings, qualify them over the email using some sort of methodology like bond, budget, authority, time need. And over the email, you can start to Taking into fact the email deliverability thing, content, and all the things that I uh, already described. So basically, you can get all of those with a team of uh, six, seven people. And if you want to close them, uh, from my experience, you will need to have two sales executives. Yeah. And again, in this kind of formula, you will have lead researchers that like work especially with the leads, nothing more, SDRs that focus on appointment scheduling like uh, and nothing on top of that and the sales executives that jump on the calls only their work would be like only talk to people uh, right. basically and uh, find fact though uh, I, I when I calculated the performance for my sales executives in Balkans uh, well we now have like uh, 10 of them I I really discovered that like the golden number to have for like around 50, 65 meetings per one sales executive. Above mm -hmm. that number, 
they will sacrifice their performance and quality how they work with those meetings so that's really interesting that not the quantity so i would I, if i would like take 100 meetings i will close more so it's a, like it's another thing so you will close less because you will be distracted in the focus it and maybe and that's more, 65 per, per week you said or no months per month months. Per, so yeah. 65 active sales opportunities is essentially what you believe is for your organization is the maximum amount to is the is the ideal amount to maximize ideal. returns on those leads and if you add an extra 30 or 40 leads on top of that you're actually going to have a net loss because yeah. you're going, your, your sales reps will be less productive. Right. You're killing your close rate and you're killing your North Stars metrics with it. So that's interesting. And uh, um, when I talk to a lot of salespeople eventually, so everyone like stay about like 40, 60. So that's the golden number. But yeah, you, you obviously can have people uh, who, who will handle hundreds of them, but they will burn out like after like quarter of doing 300 calls or so right wow and, by, okay. and, and I also to add here to clarify what kind of meetings so basically those kind of meetings that SDR will schedule to those sales executives that already qualified or pre-qualified so we have like I, I would say 80 percent uh 80 percent probability that's the right lead and 20 percent of this like you know not right time not enough budgets or whatever so that's the golden golden number of meetings. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got these hundred leads. That's that's pretty interesting. I think um, it's never been kind of communicated to me that clearly before. And I got to go back to the team and say, hey, we need to <laughs> we need to move this stuff around. And or uh, maybe we can hire you guys to be able to get them. Um, moving in the right direction. So <laughs> Belkins has been running for five years. Um, take me on like, where were you five years ago and where are you, where are you at now? How many people do you have in the organization? So yeah, uh, we currently have 300 people. Wow. There is a lot of people, <laughs> obviously, yeah. And we growing year by year, uh, twice, thrice. So basically last year we grew like 2.2 three percent uh so multiples so sorry in person okay. percent like two to three x yeah yeah two to three x yeah and the uh, year before it was like two x's and we stick to this kind of numbers from the beginning of company so we are super crazy in growth like we growing in revenue and people and in our like delivery and services that we are have on board five years ago basically we we like Michael and I, we had only like hundred bucks now out of our pockets website that we created in on Wix platform or something basically right. without like no cost. So basically we, so we, we were like really bootstrappers that had nothing and created mm -hmm. something. So that's really that a thing that I'm really proud of. Mm -hmm. So without, without like any like networking, without any skills, uh, before we started like to experiment a lot and uh, I do recall the first meetings with uh, Michael when we joined to to some potential client from US like I, uh, I remember this kind of person from Arizona so uh, speaking to like we do have a lot of experience we uh, can like the appointment setting on your behalf and let's go let's get the ball rolling you had no yeah. experience whatsoever yeah whatsoever <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was so awkward and we just like yeah, sitting yeah. okay I, we hope it will work yeah and uh we like we close them and mm -hmm. we work uh so we're a good client of ours and friend now we really work for one year in a row after that and we're starting to understand okay we closed one client we have our budget so we need to find the team and team was our friends and family in the beginning like uh mm -hmm. everyone who like do can do research talk to email to go jump on the meetings and yeah uh, back then we had like people on the on the first year of balkans we did have i suppose like 25 people, 30 people, and the year after we had 70, then 120, then 170. Yeah, and we're doing this kind of crazy growth. So yeah. So let's, 
Let's talk about that for a second. Are, are they all located in one office or are they distributed? In, are they remote, hybrid? What's your, what's your makeup? Now we are remote, but we do have three offices. We have okay. office in Denver, in Colorado. We uh -huh. opened recently office in Warsaw, Poland. Uh -huh. And we do have office in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, okay. We have a lot of great talents there. Yep. And I'm originally from Ukraine, so this just makes sense for me to, to like, you know. Yeah, I remember right. when, um, when, when the invasion started, we had, we had uh, I believe, six people in Ukraine. And I remember reaching out to every single one of them saying, I'm prepared to offer you a three months, all expenses paid trip to wherever you want to go, room and board. And two of them took it. And then four of them didn't because they never believed that re Ukraine would get invaded. And I remember two or three days after the invasion, I jumped back on to some calls with them and I said, so what's the plan? What are we doing? Right? Like, let's try to get you out of here. And they said, it's too late. And uh, they're still there. They're still working for us. I highly suggest if you're listening to this podcast right now, there's so many fantastic, talented people in Ukraine that you can no. continue to operate a business from that country. And more importantly, if you want to be able to help the war effort, one of the best things that you can do is employ Ukrainians in order to be able to make sure that they have the cash that they need to be able to keep their economy up and running. But it was just such a frustrating situation. And our uh, CTO, Alex, if he's listening to this podcast, shout out to Alex, he is still in Ukraine. Uh, at this point. And I remember us being terrified within the few, first few days of the invasion because we thought to ourselves, the stuff that Alex has in his brain is absolutely critical to the operation of the business. How are we going to uh, be able to survive if all of a sudden Alex gets cut off from the internet and just can't interact with anybody in the company? And so we did a whole bunch of things. He now has, uh, we have a whole bunch of... Um, of uh, not Tesla, what's the Elon Musk satellite? Vlad, yeah, space uh, Starlinks. Starlink. We have a whole bunch of Starlinks that we sent out to the staff so that they have like redundant internet everywhere. But even if you don't have a Starlink, the internet is fantastic and it's rock solid. And um, I yeah, you know, everyone is for, for uh, fact. doing really well in Ukraine. I know that that's probably really tough, right? Being from Ukraine and seeing what's happening right now in your country. Yeah, it's heart heartbreaking, you know. Um, I really, really, like, appreciate each and every Ukrainian that's, like, uh, pushing forward and showing this kind of resilience. We do have a lot of pro great products coming from Ukraine right now, and uh, there is, like, really, really great, amazing people that, you know, if someone considering to work or not with the Ukrainian, so I like strongly suggest to work because Ukraine is super dedicated and mm -hmm. best at what they're doing. And uh, this kind of war shows that, that basically there is nothing that can stop our people and that they like created to hard work and uh, show this kind of resilience like f for the last second. So. That's that's the great thing, obviously, yeah. So right. that's sure. inspiring. Oh yeah, um, I, my uh, my father's side of the family is Ukrainian, and uh, in Canada we have the largest Ukrainian diaspora of any other yeah. place in the world, and it's uh, it's crazy here. You walk down the street, and and there's probably in a quarter of every window is like a Ukrainian flag. We're very, very pro-Ukraine in Canada because there's so many Ukrainians that are here. They're only like second, third generation um, Ukrainians that have come back. I want to go back to growing such a massive company during like COVID, a war, right? It, it like the things that have happened to you, the, the kicks that you've gotten in the teeth have been pretty extreme. <laughs> How do you feel like, do you feel like you've done anything that other companies haven't done in order to be able to hit those targets? Did you have any kind of secret sauce for hitting a 300 plus seat organization in five years? 
Yeah, so that's the, the one of the most common questions that I'm like, getting and uh, how, how you do this, how you do this bootstrapping. So for uh, my friends from California, that's kind of super crazy when you're saying that you kind of bootstrapping everything and yeah. everyone like raising on the other hand and they just uh, like don't understand how, how this kind of, how you can accomplish that even. So uh, I think, I think there is, there is like, if I would be super straightforward and honest, mm -hmm. there is not kind of secret sauce, only hard working. So you basically spend really a lot of time to polishing all those stuff. You working with your team closely. You always put your clients first. And like, you just need to do this kind of five years long, day by day, and continue to do so for the another five years and you will be the one. And uh, Maybe maybe also I can outline that we started to be more like, you know, in the service service kind of side of companies that basically based like to delivering and to delivering like special like whatever service like uh, lead generation, I know software development or whatever consultations. So basically no one doing premium or now it's kind of more often that you can mm -hmm. like see in the market that people doing this kind of premium services mm -hmm. and we're starting to do this kind of like five years ago as the premium so we just need to spend extra time explaining always have like we should have an answer to each and every question that we're getting and uh, by doing this kind of way you will see that those kind of low-hanging fruits for you that you can like uh, grow with and it would be your uh, uh, most loyal clients because you always care of them and mm -hmm. like trust me there's so many people out there that know nothing about in our case and sales and marketing but they do have like general knowledge how to like you know I want to have a client so I should call them or I need to put uh, put uh, hundreds dollars hundred thousand dollars in advertising or whatever mm -hmm. but doing this in the right way this is the, the, the thing that people still exploring, you will continue to explore. So the hard work, always have a good sleep. That's the one of the lessons that I get uh, because I am starting to see that my mechanism, my mechanism starting to crumble after having this kind of, you know, <laughs> rush hours for growth, but still, still it's worth it if you are putting all your energy in it. Right. Yeah. No, I actually think that Hard work is a superpower and very rare. You'd be blown away by how many people say they're working. But could you put, you know, 60, 12 hour days in front of you? There are very, very few people that can truly work 12 hour days for 60 days. And running Time Doctor, um, the largest second by second work database on the planet, we can measure that. We do see that inside of um, a lot of different companies. And I would probably say the people that can consistently execute is two and a half percent, you know, below that. Um, so having that type of consistency is really, really important. I also have a, another saying that just jumped out at me as you were talking about that was, um, I don't know if you've ever heard the quote, I'd rather be a warrior in a garden, a warrior in a garden, ugh. I'd rather be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. So it's hmm. like building that type of discipline creates the environment in which you can be successful as opposed to creating an environment where you can kind of let off the gas a little bit. Maybe you're going to go and take a Friday off or you're going to go and, you know, not necessarily work as hard as some of your peers. It is so important to keep that consistency. And I've identified, at least in myself, once I'm pulling my foot off the gas, it's not an immediate effect. It probably takes about six months, but the business suffers. So being consistent with disciplined focus on the business is so critical. And so few people really truly understand it, which is uh, great that you, you've That's given that to us now. Yeah. 100%. Got another question for you here, which is what counterintuitive advice would you give to other founders to hit the type of numbers that you're currently hitting right now? 
be involved in the life of your company. So there is a common misconception that I get used to see on the market with other CEOs and founders and whatever like what thing you are building. That there is the common misconception that CEO will have less work when company will grow, but it's mm. opposite. So. You'll have so many work to do as a CEO for growing company with 500, 1,000, 5,000 people. So you like at the beginning, it was kind of vacation for you, even though it was hard. You had working on sleepless night and basically you will have like a lot of on your plate speaking to different people. You will have like your bureaucratization in a process where you will have uh, layers with management. You will have your heads, uh, you will have middle management, you will have team leaders and you will have a lot of people, obviously. And you as a CEO need to be on top of those and be like, have, like you basically need to understand how to run your business. But if you do, you know, outsource to your, I didn't know, to your heads and spend time on Hawaii. So um, I don't think that's the, you, 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 you obviously can have a great people and great people can do so, but without a leader that knows what kind of struggle is, that can like, you know, uh, get the shovel and dig with them. So basically be, be in the one, one place with your team is super important. And yeah. On the growth, especially, you you always need to like, you need to be involved. Do not try to be in another close like be, like behind behind closed door taking all those decisions. You have team that affecting by those decision, affected by those decision, and you can always talk to them. Work as a team, not as a one guy saying some like from the top. You know, uh, any any kind of tasks, KPIs, or whatever uh, things that other CEO is doing, it, sh like, it will not work this way. Because if you are not in the same shoes as your team, so I don't think it would be a successful, successful approach at all. You, uh, you basically have pulled the words out of a very famous general's mouth, Hannibal Africanus. Hannibal took almost all of Rome. And he said his biggest uh, factor towards success is he would be in the trenches with the troops. He would sleep with them. He would work with them. He was no higher than anyone else. And that's why they would go and do just absolute ridiculous things for him in comparison to other generals that wouldn't. So that uh, works. I, com I, com I believe you're completely right on that one. Uh, I've got some quick questions that I usually do at the end of the interview that are the same for every single person. Go ahead. Uh, first question I have for you is, what's the biggest mistake you made in your business? And I want the one that jumps into your head, not the one that you think about for 30 seconds and you say, oh, I Good. can't give them that one, I can't give them that one. Give me the one that you're thinking about that you can't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure thing. So, um, with having no experience of building products, we're starting to build a product. And we did the, our Folgerly as a first product. And we did so many mistakes. And uh, even though you can imagine, so for the year and a half and i can say that that's kind of mistake that cost us like a year of living like for mm -hmm. developers for product designers that we are realized after the one year of developing mm -hmm. so basically we are spend a lot of time to, uh, it's related to architecture on what we build folgerly as our email deliverability solution behind the processes so basically okay. we go with the monolith architecture when you have like mm -hmm. one pillar and with this pillar and with growth, it's starting to be starting to be like bigger, bigger, and you have this if problem. So you yeah. basically trying to pull the stone, and stone will like uh, have so it will be so heavy that you you will like fall down eventually. Okay. So we're starting to think that it was our mistake, and we should go with the microservices to split each and every function of our product to different like you know microservice that will be connected to each other and when we started to realize that we need to you know do refactoring mm -hmm. from monolith architecture to microservice architecture we spent one year of doing this and uh, my, my developers in my product team and they're like like on the 10 months 11 months so they were so pissed off so they like go to me like in the meeting and say why we're doing this 
I, I don't want to do this anymore. And this kind of things that <laughs> pulls life out of my body. And this kind of thing that's cost me like and my team personally like a year and a year of my life right. was a bad decision that I like this is just the consequences of not having the product experience. But still, you always need to have like do proper research and uh, understand how to build whatever you wanted to build. Mm. It's um, I'll share a very, very quick story with you as well for everyone else that you thank you very much for sharing that. Um, but I have one that's even scarier. <laughs> I had uh, we were completely re-architecting Time Doctor because we had a lot of technological debt and we had one single monolith versus a microservices model. And we were actually doing a complete refactoring over to a new build. And we were around six months in on building this new version of Time Doctor, but we had everyone else still operating on the other version. And I remember going into our yearly meeting with our team and I said, so we've got some scaling issues here. It looks like we're almost at capacity in terms of the servers. And they said, no, we can spin more up. It's not an issue. Uh, it's not going to be an issue for a year and a half in terms of scaling. Two months later, our service completely shuts down for 72 hours. Completely. Nice. No time is being tracked for a time tracking company, which was a disaster. And we lost a million ARR just in those three days because customers obviously said, why are you not up? I need to go and switch to something else immediately. I need to do a payroll. I need to do this. I need to do that. And uh, thankfully, we had had that version that was being built for that previous six months. And then we almost immediately started transferring everyone over to that new version. And now today, 90% of our customers run on the new build of Time Doctor and about 10% are on that old build. But I'm still terrified that at any day, that old build could completely collapse because we're just not applying the engineering resources to that old version than we are to the new right. version. So technological debt will kick you in the face and it, you won't even know it's coming. So yeah, right. you might be sitting there thinking, oh yeah, I've got about 10 million ARR in my books right now of, of you know, everything great recurring flourishing. revenue. And then all of a sudden lights go out and then you've got to figure out what to do next, which True. is uh, terrifying. I know. I know that's pain. I also have one story that uh, comes to the second thought and out of my mind about the pale. So after uh, like um, another release that we have from the product standpoint, our stripe went down for uh, like three or four days. Mm -hmm. And we had this kind of issue that all of our clients suddenly are starting to rebuild. Like we got a lot of rebuilds. So we do have like some client at some company, example.com, let's say. And we're starting to build them until their cards were within a sufficient amount. So mm -hmm. it's kind of went so crazy. So we do have like a lot of transactions. We started to collect money so crazy. And we're starting to get uh, like calls from our clients. What the fuck are you doing? What kind of, what's this kind of transaction with 500,000 uh, trying to charge me for whatever you're doing? And we just super, it's super stressed. And we, we were in the middle of business season. So yeah. I can say that I really love to develop products. Mm. That's so fun. <laughs> so much fun there. Right. <laughs> well, and th that brings me on to my next question here. What's the biggest thing that's stopping you from getting to the next level in your business? Yeah. So I call this uh, thing about the experience and uh, taking the fact that I am not like, like graduated from Harvard or Stanford or whatever. And I'm, um, I can say that I'm like getting the street MBA from running my company, get all the mistakes that you can possibly get in my face, punching me on initial kind of uh, weekday, uh, month or whatever. And I can say that I'm currently on the verge of transition to, I forgot the great book about, uh, uh, about life stages of company. So there is like basically five or six stages of company like you have in a, like a big at the beginning to 50 people from 50 to 150 from 150 to 300 people 300 500 500 7, uh, 700 and 1000 plus and we have this kind of transition it all it's all about the operation eventually i discovered it all about the operation 
and you need to have right people with the right department, even though it is department that never had the problem. So you have like, I don't know, marketing department or sales department or delivery department that always like stars, like uh, they're doing their KPIs, they're doing super well, but eventually, suddenly I, think I would say something went wrong. So on the scale, you just have more people, more people coming and on the 300 people, I'm starting to see that without additional operation people, like sales operation person, marketing operation person, that would take your processes on another level, on another scale, that will help you to like, I, I don't like to say, uh, like create something more bureaucratic, but will structureize processes and avoid like difficult or simple question and optimize time within the company or other people. And mm -hmm. it will help you to transition your company to 500 people afterwards. So basically you need to have right people. It, it may be obvious for someone, but when you are like growing super fast, right. but uh, it's not kind of, you always think that you have right people, they are super smart and it's not about the people at all. It's about the number of, it's it, it about the entire quality or headcount that you will eventually face and how your HR, recruitment, administrative, financial, legal will take care of this because this would be the rough time for them to scale those things up. So mm -hmm. I'm, I already fixed all those things and we are ready to go to 500. Uh, I think uh, in the middle of uh, next year or by the end, we will definitely hit this number. Mm. Um, but yeah, the street MBA, the one of the things that you always need to consider and try to sit and try to, you know, predict or foresight what kind of thing that you can get or you expecting to get, even though you don't, you, you always can be like 100% sure, but you need to think about what would be, what I, what I will work with on 500 people or 1000 people, what I need to do, where I need to sit, what the kind of people that I want to are, uh, have around me. So yeah. Right. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I think about that a lot as well. Process documentation to me is absolutely critical to your overall success as a business and is one of those things that is a constant drag on overall output and productivity, uh, particularly running a remote organization is so important. Uh, next question that I have for you here is what do you think your industry needs to do differently? If you could just <laughs> yeah. wave your magic wand and something would disappear. Oh change. my God. Yeah. I have this kind of pain that all like suddenly all clients of service companies will face or facing right now. It's basically people doesn't care about their clients. So we do have our competitors that lifting like burn, like really burn out land mm. with all of those kind of promises that they do to clients, which is like over exaggerating or like overselling because they wanted to grow or get some like top pain from those kind of clients. Yeah. And we work with those that coming to us and say, well, I know that I, like, I want to work with you, but I can go with like, I don't know, with uh, your guarantees or upfront payments or whatever terms you have, because I do have burnout from other company that promised me a lot and they didn't deliver and uh, how you are. Uh, yeah, so basically I wanted to all those companies listen and like listen actually and listen to their clients, try to make good for them mm -hmm. because it's super simple, but everyone's starting to, you know, starting to chase more cash on revenue and eventually you will end up with those people who really have bad experience and don't want to work with any of those kind of companies out there even though you are super uh, like number one or whatever uh, because they had like bad taste of other work with other other clients uh, or other companies of uh, bringing their own clients in our case in the lead generation space. I have exactly the same perspective as you. I would say my scar tissue is about 80% of the agencies that I've worked with that have promised me X have not delivered on X. And it's incredibly frustrating. Um, one of the methodologies that I've built recently actually, which has been really great, is treat an agency just like an internal employee. Do weekly one-on-ones, mm -hmm. identify KPIs, how are we on target in terms of hitting those KPIs? What early indicators can we look at today 
to identify that we're doing the right work and we're moving in the right direction or we're not moving in the right direction. But even with that, it has been really difficult. I agree. There has been some, there have been companies that just come in and uh, I get a lot of requests to talk about SEO because that's how we built our business. Yeah. And so many SEO agencies are just selling you absolute snake oil. <laughs> and it's just, you know, and I look at what they're doing and there are, there are SEO companies that reach out to us saying, we can completely change your, you know, your right. SEO and your search engine optimization and we can get you to the top of Google. And then I take a look at their website and they have a domain authority of like 10. And, and I'm thinking to myself, how are you going to teach me how to be able to hit, get real traffic when you can't even do it for your own website? You know, I find that incredibly frustrating and infuriating, but probably a podcast for another day. Uh, yeah. With that said, I want to thank you for coming on. Website is belkins.io. Is there any other links that, uh, or places that people can get a hold of you that we want to be able to tell everyone about? I think... I think so. LinkedIn would be the right place to find Bel okay. Belkins or myself. And you can also find out our podcast, uh, Growth Podcast, actually. It, right. it name. We have like really great people out there, the voices like Nel Patel and others Got that's it. sharing their experience, lifestyle. That's also like interesting to hear. Appreciate it, Vlad. Thank you very much. And for everyone, Liam, pleasure is mine. I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>